Hello and welcome to Find Your Freedom, a podcast dedicated to helping you truly find freedom in all aspects of life. Join your hosts and their expert guests as they share practical tips and strategies for finding more freedom in your life. It's time to take control of your life and create the future you want. Let's find your freedom. Here are your hosts, Lenny the Boss and Omid Rad Investor. Boom, boom, boom. We are back with another fantastic episode of Find Your Freedom. And before we talk about the guests that we have on today, which I'm letting you know you're going to love it, right? This episode is being sponsored by Wealth Builders Mortgage Group. So if you're in the market for a personal home, if you're in the market for a, a rental property, regardless if it's a long term or short term, then I'm telling you right now, Wealth Builders Mortgage Group is the place to be. Omid uses them. I use them. So right now we need you to use them. And just to let you know, we have a young lady on from Wealth Builders Mortgage Group. But today, you know, we're going to talk about something special. All right. You know, one of the big things out there is cash out refinances. And we have the specialist on today that we're going to talk everything through. We're going to talk about equity. We're going to talk about when to use it, how to use it, how you get eligible, what it is. All right. So um, I'm telling you, you don't want to miss this episode. So tune in, turn it up. And we're going to bring on Parker. Parker, 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 how you doing? Hey, doing great. How are you? <laughs> Oh man, feeling amazing. We're um happy to have you and we're happy to talk about this topic because this topic with when it comes to cash out refinance, it really made a lot of people rich. I'm going to I'm going to call it how you how you see it. It's 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 one of the wealth building tools when it comes to um real estate and use correctly, you can really sit here and um, you know, make a difference in your life, right? When it comes to, you know, financially. So uh, before we jump into it, if you could just give the audience a little background on yourself, please. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Parker and I am the founder of Wealth Builders Mortgage Group team. So we're actually a team that works under Movement Mortgage, which is a, a big national residential lender. Um, but my, my team specializes in investment loans, helping your client, your guests, everybody, um, purchase residential real estate for investment. And we love short-term rentals. That's really our, our niche. Uh, I also am an investor myself. We've got 12 short-term rentals between the Smokies and the Panhandle of Florida. And so, you know, over the years, I feel like we've been blessed to find our freedom with the real estate. And so I am passionate about helping people learn about it understand it and acquire properties. And so that's what, uh, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Man. So, um, just a side note, um, how do you underwrite properties for yourself? Like, uh, <laughs> like, like, how does that work? Do you, do you like, how do you get a loan? Like do you have to pass it off to one of your members or how does that work? <laughs> Yes. Oh, that's a really great question. I cannot underwrite my own loans oh, or, it, yeah. or process my own loans. Um, but I do put a nice little packet together, hand it over and tell my boss, I'm like, here you go. This is how you need to do it. And they, they do it. So yeah, so I, I, I'm involved, but uh, that, that's funny. All right. There you go. Okay. That's very yeah. funny. I mean, I never yeah. would have thought to even ask that question but yeah. it's true like how yeah. do you like that that would be great like you, you should be having you know that 12 properties you should have like 112 yeah. properties approved right approved, approved. <laughs> that's pretty cool hey you know um you know um this this cash out refinance is is huge and there's a lot of people who's listening right now and they're saying to themselves what in the world are they talking about this cash refinance that can get you rich right so i guess if you could just for those that really don't don't know what it is can we just give just a clear definition of what a cash refinance is absolutely so a cash out refi is where you own a property whether it's your primary home a second home vacation home or even investment uh, occupancy property and you have enough equity, meaning you either maybe you own it free and clear, 
where you don't have a mortgage on it. Or if you do have a mortgage on it, there's enough additional equity value there that would allow you to basically do a new mortgage. So that new mortgage would pay off your old mortgage if you have one. And then you could be able to take out the difference uh, in cash. And so then you have cash to use to invest, um, hopefully in more real estate, because that's a great asset class. Uh, but you could use it cash for anything you wanted, whether it was improvements or investing in the stock market, whatever it may be. Okay, cool. So, um, so I want to share a little story. So uh, back in 2018, 2019, so I, I bought my personal residence in 2010. So I bought it kind of at the bottom of the market. Nice. Um, ra you know, rates were okay. Like, I mean, they were like, you know, I'm trying to think what my rate was probably like in the fives, maybe I think back then. Sounds um, right. anyways, I was, um, kind of in this transitional period where I wanted to try to look into investing. And, and so I just decided, Hey, let's, um, you know, I have some equity in my home now. Why don't I pull some money out? And this is before rates went down to like 3% or 2%. Um, so I decided, Hey, I'm going to pull out 150 K and with this 150 K I'm going to try to look and try to invest into something. Um, long story short, um, what I ended up doing was, uh, I ended up having to, uh, I pulled the money out, but then I then refied again when the rates went down even lower. So now I had this, this 150 K sitting in my bank and I was trying to figure out what to do with it. Well, we, we invested in, in short-term rentals. So there's, there's two approaches, which is interesting. And maybe we can get into that a little bit, but, um, yeah, with that 150 K I ended up investing in multiple properties and that ended up kind of compounding and that 150k if you were to kind of put a number to it let's just say it it moved up like you know five six times because i invested in in different properties at the right time and equity into other homes um but um there's there's two type of approaches some some say why don't you uh pay off a home and you have no debt so that's a very conservative approach and you have the, another approach which is you can leverage uh, some debt to create some additional income or create some additional wealth. And so there's different approaches and everybody may have maybe a different risk tolerance. And so um, maybe Parker, like when, you know, when somebody's coming to you um, and they, they have those conversations, like, what does that look like? Or, or, or like, what are you, what are you looking to kind of understand um, before you underwrite a deal for somebody? Yeah. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, as far as the loan is concerned, I mean, they could really do whatever they want with the money, but, <laughs> but what I try to help people think through when they're deciding if this is right for them is I think the most important thing is what's their purpose? What do they want to use this money for? Um, you know, is it to go on a vacation, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend, but, but you could, <laughs> Hey, maybe you, maybe it's on your bucket list and you want to go travel Europe for a year. What do we, I'm not going to stop you. Um, you know, or is it, uh, or, or is it to reinvest, you know? And I think that's probably the number one thing to your point that people should kind of think through what's, what's the purpose of the cash they want to pull out. Um, maybe it is, maybe they want to, you know, I know we talk about find your freedom, right? Yeah. Sometimes people's version of freedom is not having a mortgage on their primary home. So maybe somebody purchased a short term rental back in 19 and they've got like 400,000 they could pull out from it and they only owe 300 on their primary home. Mm -hmm. Maybe they want to be free and feel good about having no debt on their primary. So, um, and to your point, I think that also comes in when you talk about people's tolerances. Yeah, like, do they want to grow that money and, and reinvest it and make more? Is that is that their urge? Or are they a little more conservative, want to play it safe? And, you know, maybe they're not as worried and concerned about that. So, yeah, so those are some of the, the conversations I would have initially to find out um, their why. You know, and, and, and that's good. You know, I mean, I'm happy you asked that question. That was a really great question because um, I'm going to share a, a story, too. You know, like one of the big things that stop people from investing into real estate is what? 
I don't have the money, right? You know, yeah. that, 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 yeah. that, that's one of the big stoppers. They're like, man, I really want to do it. I love what you're doing. I understand it. But unfortunately, I don't have the money. So, you know, I, I, I early on, I, I coached this student. He, he wanted to get into real estate. And he was one of those individuals. He was married. Let me just preference this. He was married. He had three kids, I believe, at the time. You know, um, bought a house of the personal home of his own, maybe like, two years before we get, we got to talking and uh, he's like, Hey man, I hear about two or $3,000 in the bank or something like that. And I'm like, you know, obviously you know, you're going to need a little more than that, <laughs> you know, to help out. But one thing he didn't know about, he didn't know anything about equity. So I asked him the question. I said, Hey, you know, how much equity do you have in your home? And he was like, looking at me like a deer in headlights like what 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 are you talking about so we went through come to find out this sucker had ninety thousand dollars worth of equity in his yeah. home so you know we went through the process and you know i showed him what he needed to do he refinanced his personal home and now on the date he has four additional properties for him understanding what equity is what a cash refinance is and how to use it to so and the reason I'm telling this story is because you know immediately you mentioned the two types of approach which is no right or wrong is whatever you decide to do yeah. right is that some people are not in position to have the cash but you might have uh, what they call it paper cash which is inside of yeah. your home and by learning these strategies you know um it, it it definitely can help out so I guess Parker can you talk to that just just a little bit yeah, absolutely. And and like you, I actually have a client right now who um, they they live in Georgia and brand new to getting into short term rentals, but they're really excited about the opportunity and they're and that the income ratio looks great and everything. And they're like, but we just we just don't have the cash. And so and they, how do we get the cash out of our, our primary home? And so we talked about the equity and they actually have about 100,000 they can pull out of their primary home. And so, yeah, so. Now, I will tell you too, I know we're talking about cash out refis, but there's the sister to the cash out refi as well, which may benefit some people. And that's the HELOC, um, which and the HELOC is going to typically be a little bit more conservative. I would say if you're looking at doing tapping into equity on a second home or investment property, you may have better luck with a cash out refi just because they're a little more challenging to get through with the banks and credit unions. Your primary home, I would always recommend you you look at that equity line of credit. It's similar to a cash out refi, um, and I don't want to confuse people here, <laughs> but um, it's similar to a cash out refi, but it, it's another way to do it. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But in terms of getting started with a cash out refi, it's, it's actually very similar to a regular mortgage when you're purchasing. All that, like the, the qualifications and the documentation debt to income ratio, that all works the same. You just don't have a sales contract. And so for those who are interested, um, what that process would look like is call a loan originator like me <laughs> <laughs> or, or anybody you trust and, and work with. Um, but make that call. You have to have kind of a general idea of what you think the value of your property is. And I always warn people, be a little conservative with this number because for whatever reason, appraisers tend to be, well, actually, I know why. I think appraisers are a little more conservative on refinance values because they don't have a target price. So for purchases, they know what the target is. For refinances, they don't know. Hmm. We, we don't tell them. Um, and so I think because of that reason, they tend to be just naturally a little more conservative on value. Um, so that being said, have kind of a conservative idea of, of what you think the value is. And then on primary homes, your max loan to value is 80% for a cash out refi. That means that you can take out a total of up to 80% of the value of your home. So just for really easy math, let's say your home was worth $100,000. 80% of that is 80,000. Mm -hmm. If you have an existing, an existing mortgage of say, 40,000 on there. That means when you do a cash out refi, you would refinance. So you'd pay off that 40,000 mortgage you already have. 
you'd get a new mortgage for 80,000. And what you'd be given at closing is the difference between paying off that old mortgage and the 80. So you'd get about, I mean, there's some other paying closing costs and all that. That's minor. You'd be getting about 40,000 in cash in your pocket at closing Boom. in that example. <laughs> there you go. Yes. And second home investment, same thing, except at 75 LTV, 75 loan to value. And so instead of getting the 80,000 mortgage, in that same example, you'd get a seventy-five thousand and pocket about thirty-five. And pocket, just to be clear, is up to eighty, up to seventy-five, right? Depending on your Correct. your your personal uh, DNA, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You never have to take that maximum amount, but you can okay. totally up to you. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's a I think it's a great strategy, and if you want to acquire and and kind of to Lenny's point. I think sometimes the bottleneck to either purchasing real estate is the down payment. Um, and, and I think what, you know, maybe Parker, you can kind of speak on this a little bit is uh, just different loan products. Because I think traditionally when I talk to newer investors, they think they need 20% down and that's the only option. And um, there's like, maybe you can just talk about like, some loan products. So let's say just hypothetically, somebody does a refinance, they, they have a, you know, they, they have some money that they want to invest now. And um, what, what are like um, some loan products that, that might be available to people or investors that may not require 20% down? Absolutely. So, um, so when getting into short-term rentals, the, the really cool thing about a lot of the locations of these short-term rentals is that they're in great destinations to vacation whether it's the beach, the mountains, the desert. Um, and so a lot of times you can't, if, as long as you do have the intention of also utilizing this property yourself at some point throughout the year for vacation, then you can do what we call a second home. Some people know it as a vacation home loan. And this one is a minimum of 10% down payment. So 10% is all, is all that's typically required on this loan. Um, now, if for some reason you don't quite fall under that or that's not your not the case for you, if you're doing a conventional loan, we can do investment occupancy. And the investment occupancy conventional loan is a minimum 15% down. So mm -hmm. still under that that 20% minimum that you're right. A lot of people do because I, I talk to a lot of people also on a daily basis and they they think 20, some even 25. Some get told 25%. So some people are calling banks or credit unions and they're being told 25% because that is, so, so when I say banks, like depository banks, so like we're a residential lender, we're not a depository bank, but if you go to a depository bank or a credit union, they might require 25% oh, down wow. on an investment property. Yeah. So I think, so I think sometimes people automatically like go where they bank and ask them and get, that's the answer for them and don't know that there are other options out there. So, so Parker, there's people right now listening and they're saying, oh my God, this is a way for me to kickstart, you know, my uh, real estate journey. Is it do this cash out refinance? So they like, okay, I'm down. Like I'm in. I'm All right. So what's the first step? So let's just say, let's call this person. Let's make up a person. Let's call him John, right? You know, so John, he's in the gym right now and he's listening and he's like, okay, I hear Omid. You know what he mentioned about the bottleneck. I'm, I, I fall into the bottleneck and I, I, I have a house that I've been living there for 10 years. Right. And I don't know anything about this equity thing. Like where do they start to figure out even the the um, the value of their home? Because they might not even have a clue on how much their home is valued at. Yeah, that's a very good and tricky question <laughs> <laughs> to answer. <laughs> um, you know, let, let's talk about good old Zillow here for a minute. Um, you know, here's the deal. Zillow, I know everybody cracks a lot of jokes about Zillow and it's not super accurate, but however, it's a good, it's a ballpark. Zillow gets that data from somewhere. Zillow gets their data from data in the area. So it's not horrible. Um, personally, what I would do with a client, cause I understand appraisals and, and generally what an appraiser is going to look for. Although I'm careful, like I never know what they're actually going to come back with, but I have a pretty good understanding. And so the appraiser is going to look for the 
closest, most comparable, most recent sales. And they can't ignore neighborhood sales. Meaning like if you go in and you want to see, so there's a feature on Zillow where you can go and look at sold properties. Mm -hmm. And then and you put in your address. You might have to do it a couple times to get it to zoom in on your address. So look under sold. And I usually, and you can toggle it and change it to like within the last six months or 12 months. I'll usually start at six just to see what the most accurate is, but I'll go up to 12. And then I'll kind of start to zoom out and you can set that square footage. I usually do about 750 above and below what your square footage is. Okay. And just see what the results come back at. And, and what's going to give you the most realistic idea of what your house is valued is to see what comps that are most recent, most similar, most similar and closest to you have sold for and, and go from there. Um, don't look at price per square foot. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, price per square foot doesn't work because it doesn't take into account differences in the property. Let's say like Smoky Mountains, for example, right? You could have two identical 2,000 square feet properties. One may have this amazing view of the mountains, be five years old, right? And then down the street, maybe even a quarter mile away, you could have another 2,000 square foot cabin with no view that's maybe 20 years old and not updated. Mm. Those two are, they're going to be the same square feet, but they're not going to have the same price per square foot. Right. So, yeah. So that's, so that's why on Zillow, go look at the actual properties that are similar to yours and see what dollar they sold for. Maybe compare that a little bit to this estimate. And um, I think that's a good idea. Awesome. To, to get the value. So let's let's say we went through that process and we're like, okay, I think there there might be some equity in my home. Um, and then, uh, so what's what's typically the next steps? Like, if I'm somebody who's like a borrower and I want to make your underwriting process the easiest possible, what are things that I should have lined up or know I should have prepared in advance so that way um, it makes the underwriting process you know more smooth for you know let's say for myself and the refinance process. Yeah. So if you have, if you are self-employed or have a component that of self-employment, uh, or if you have rentals and you have rental income, we definitely need the most recently filed tax return. So we can use the 22 returns. Um, if you filed an extension for 23, that's fine. We can use 22 up until the final October deadline. Um, so we'll need at least one of those returns to show rental income or self-employment. Now, if you're W-2 and we're not using rental income or we're not using any self-employment, we don't need tax returns, just need your most recent pay stub really? and potentially your last pay stub of the previous year yeah. to get started. To, that's for a debt to income ratio. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And then what about yeah. like, what about like, um, um, so like debt to income ratio, I think that's like confusing for a lot of investors and knowing, okay, well, I only make this and, but my, my rent is this, but, um, uh, maybe you can kind of walk through like even, let's say you, I have one short term rental, um, and it's profitable. Like how is that incorporated or, or how does that work in, uh, in, in everything and in, in, in the underwriting component of it? Yeah. So, and this is where I really encourage I'm trying to think of how to say this. It, it gets complicated and it's even complicated for a lot of loan originators. Mm. And there's a lot of loan originators who get this wrong. And I know because I step in and save loans there you go. because of this. Hear that. And step in and save loans. Step in and save Parker. the day. You know? Parker well, saved me, she saved me before. So yeah, that's, uh, you know, <laughs> well, tell that quick story real quick. Yeah. Omi. What, what, you know, how did she save you? <clears throat> um, well, okay. So before we get into that, yeah. So <laughs> I would say I was, I was purchasing a short term, uh, rental mm -hmm. and it was with another lender and, um, we were getting quoted, um, a DSCR loan. So DS, the DSCR loan, I think the rate was like, I'm going to say like over 10, it was like 10 and some change at the time during, um, anyways, I, I go to Parker and I'm like, Hey, um, I, I don't have a W-2 at the current time. Um, I'm strictly self-employed. And so uh, from my understanding, I don't qualify um, to for like a traditional 30-year loan. Um, but Parker was able to kind of, yeah, it's, maybe she can explain it better, but 
you know, she qualified me for a 30 year and, um, and I think she did it through, um, based off of like the actual income that we were anticipating for the property. And, um, I was able to save, I think it was like three points or so. Oh, wow. I'm going to say on the loan, which translated into $1,500 in savings a month. So that was a difference in the, the, um, the mortgage. So big savings. Big win. Yeah. So I'm yeah. like, and the reason, the only reason I knew this is because I talked to another investor who had just done the same thing with Parker and I just happened to run, like run into him at an, and I was like, Hey, so how are you financing this? And he's like, Oh yeah, yeah, no Parker, you know, she can do it. And I'm like, okay. I was like, and she's like, and you can do it this way. And I was like, Oh, I didn't know that was even an option. So, mm -hmm. but, and I think the lender I was using, didn't know it was an option or didn't underwrite it that way. So j j yeah. j just to be clear, I, I just want to highlight something. So Parker saved you $18,000 yeah. a year. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I owe her, I owe her big, so, yeah. you know, and, and you got to then You're multiply welcome. that over a 30 year period. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? True. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's a lot. I mean, yeah. you know, you're talking yeah. about, over <laughs> over a half a million dollars, all because yeah. of what what uh, so Parker is super knowledgeable about you know what she does in the industry, right? She's up on every latest and greatest you know product that's out there. So you know, and that's big. I just kind of wanted to highlight that because you know that's important that you go yeah. with the right. It, it, some people think that oh, I'm just going to look online and. And and they see, you know, somewhere that they can go. And I guess that's cool if you want to sit here and pay an extra $540,000 or you can find someone that's really skillful in the market to like, like a Parker that can sit here and, um, you know, save you money due to just understanding the industry, understanding your current situation. And also real quick, Parker, how many transactions go mm -hmm. through your desk roughly a year? Well, I mean, I know I'm putting yeah. you on the spot, putting you and Omid on the spot today. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, well, in, in the height of when everything was booming, we were doing, uh, I think we did 646 in 2022, about the same in 2021. I mean, it was almost to a day that we were closing, you know, it didn't uh -huh. quite happen that regimented, right. but yeah. Um, you know, I'd say we're probably about a third of that right now, just with everything slowing and rates slowing. And and how much is that so, in dollars? Yeah. I think that that's where people really thrive. <laughs> yeah. So again, in the height, we were closing like 323 million yeah. a year, um, per year. And then last year, I think we we're at like 124 million. Now, the, the, so, the, and this year we're tracking a little bit more than the that. reason why I kind of wanted to throw that out there. And I'm, I'm happy, um, we just talked about this is because, you know, we want everyone to understand that Parker did so many transactions that she ran into probably just about every scenario that you could run through out there. <laughs> so your best bet is to go with someone with just the experience because, you know, like just like Omid, he said, hey, he just didn't think or no, and Omid is a super smart dude. So let me just make sure everybody get this right. You know, yeah. but he just didn't yeah. know. And, yeah. um, and yeah. but his smartness allowed him to ask someone Right. Question Which it. got yeah. him, you know, um, the savings. And I just wanted to highlight yeah. that because I, I think that um, a lot of people think that they can just go into any bank or any loan, up, which you can, you know, but you won't get the best value. Right. Or the best situation that you're yeah. supposed to get, you know, when you're not dealing with someone as experienced. So sorry for 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 highlighting some of both of your um, beauties over here. But uh, yeah. I, I, I thought that was important. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. And and going back to Amid's situation, Amid, I think with yours, it had been because you had left your W-2 and, uh, but you had cabin rentals. And so yeah. I think whoever you, you had worked with and on the front end of that, um, either they didn't quite understand how to apply that rental income that you had or how to apply it being in the business that you guys filed it in. Um, and then how to also, because yeah, I did a combination of using that self-employment and rental income, and then also the rental income projection from the property you were purchasing. And those two things lined up and that's how you could go forward with a conventional loan. You know, when it comes to, and, and there's a handful of, of lenders, I feel like in the industry that kind of understand the intricacies of some of this, um, but not many. And then the other thing that really gets me is sometimes I feel like, I hate to say this, but sometimes I think 
loan originators can just be lazy. Like the DSCR mm. was the easier path to take mm. because sometimes underwriters don't even know the stuff that we take to them. And so I have to fight the underwriters on a, not a daily basis. They're pretty good. We've got some of the same underwriters now. So now they're used to a lot of these scenarios. And, and that's the thing too. Like I also have a team, the same team that's been with me for five years. That's important. Um, that's important. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so like my, LO, my, my LOAs, the loan officer assistants understand the processors, like everybody understands most of these scenarios. And so, so it's the thing too. It's not, um, my job is not easy. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that I don't even let the client know we were doing. And so, um, there's a lot of back and forth and having to get management involved when the underwriter is not understanding it, but you know, you're right. And so anyway, so, so yeah, so that's why you really need uh, somebody who, who knows. And, um, but, but yeah, I mean, you may be talking to someone you think would know. And again, either they just don't understand it or they're unfortunately being lazy. I mean, hey, you, Parker, you know, man, the, the, when I realized Parker was better than the rest, honestly, was I was a W-2 employee at the time and um, we was buying a, a property. It was like, I don't know, $800,000 or something. And um, the way that I was getting paid from my employment, you know, I was um, very low uh, base pay, but very heavy, heavy, heavy when it came to um, bonuses, right? And what was happening was it just so happens that they changed the way that they pay out the bonus structure that year. See, Parker shaking it. <laughs> like, I remember this. <laughs> you know, it, I'm not thinking there's a problem because I'm looking at it as the economics is going to be the same as the prior years, right? However, you know, it wasn't like that. And I was actually getting super nervous that I was not going to get this property. So can you talk on that one a little bit more? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and this, I'm glad you brought this up because this is like, I've seen some other people put out these debt to income ratio calculators and everything. I hesitate to, like, I really encourage people not to, don't even try to calculate your debt to income ratio. Just, I mean, you can, but really just talk to one of us. Let it like, don't hurt your head. Don't bang your head against the wall because there's so like even bonuses, like there's so many guidelines that the average person shouldn't know. <laughs> That's our job. Like we read guidelines every day. It's like going to a lawyer. You don't know the, you know, statute 400 page 12, whatever, right? <laughs> Same thing. Um, so when it comes to variable income, like bonuses, I mean, the guidelines say you average it over two years. And I think in your situation, Lenny, if I remember correctly, like the prior year, you had gotten a lot less. I think your like your base was higher, but your bonus was lower. Yes. And then that next year, they restructured it to where your uh, base was loaner, lower, but your bonus potential was higher. Right. So typically, and what some LOs may do, because I think they have to, is just average the two years. And then your bonus would have looked. So now your base is lower. So we have to, the base, we just have to use whatever you're currently getting paid. So if your base is lower, we've got to use the lower amount period. Mm -hmm. The bonus, though, they then would have averaged the last two years and it would have made the average lower because the year before when that structure is different. So somebody who really understands how to do this. So what I did on your behalf is I, I had to, I had to like lay that all out for him and say, Hey guys, here's the deal. Here's why we can't average. We've got to go on the last year bonus. We can't average it because it doesn't make sense to average it. Here's why they changed this whole structure, you know? And so the underwriters have to make sure at the end of the day that they're following guidelines and that if the loan gets audited by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which they do, this isn't like the IRS where you have one in a million chances. There's a fairly decent chance of a loan getting audited by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't fall back on you. So if Fannie and Freddie don't like that loan, it kicks it back to us. You would never know. Mm. That just hurts the lender. Got you. Um, and then we have to buy it back. It costs the company a few hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it's a big deal to get a buyback on a loan. So that's why the underwriters are very particular about meeting guidelines. But the whole process is great. Like, you know, underwriting is the most stressful thing in the world, period. Right. Yeah. It, it is because yeah. you don't know. It's the unknown. Right. Well, me smiling. Yeah. Over, like, I know. Right. <laughs> but Parker team made me feel comfortable. And I believe you even had a call with my um, HR person. Right? Probably. You know? I'm sure we did. <laughs> you know, yeah. like they go, be by the <laughs> they go yeah. beyond the scope. And, you know, she had a call with my HR person, which, you know, 
whatever was needed to be laid out got laid out and and that was a i think that was the the seal the deal uh yeah. item there yeah yeah we just have to have enough info documentation basically to cover our ass right so if annie freddie come back the underwriter can justify why we did what we did and they're like okay all right we see the documentation that makes sense I and I also think like um thinking about like my first experience with a loan to like you know like currently I think when you first you don't know what you don't know right so it's yeah. it almost seems like it, you could perceive it as being adversarial like oh why are they asking me this question why yeah. I I'm yeah. I'm telling the <laughs> truth and and like you know I'm not a liar or or you know I gave you what you wanted and and um, yeah. I think uh, you know, over time you start realizing, okay, this, this is just like, they got to cover their basis and you got to like, and you know, what I'm hearing from Parker is, uh, you know, in the background, what she's trying to do is like really advocate to make the underwriting process more smooth so that you, she bears a brunt of all the back and forth where the, the, you know, the, the person doesn't have to. And I think that's, that's great because I think sometimes when you do some of some of those larger institutional lenders, you know, there's a lot more red tape and maybe, or, or like there's less like wiggle room with regards to like pushing back and, and they're like, this is the policy and this is what it is. And you have to give X document or, so it's like, I've, I've had such a wide variety of experiences. Um, all right. So Parker, so, all right. So we, we've, we've gone through the process now. So we've, <laughs> Um, you know, we, we call, we kind of figured out, we, we were going to have some money in our property. We're, you know, now going through the underwriting process and then now there's like, you know, potentially we're going to, you know, pull the money out. So what is like the typical, um, timeline that, that people will experience when they're going from like beginning to end, um, just so that, you know, kind of what the expectation is, um, you know, as, as they go through the, all the motions. The cash, yeah, the cash out refi, I'd say, I mean, we can always push to get something done super fast, but I'd say three to four weeks is pretty typical for cash out refi. On occasion, what I've seen drag it out a little is if that appraised value comes in under and, you, and we want to rebut it and fight it. And on rare occasion, sometimes if it came in super low and, and we really have some hard data and documentation to show that eh, maybe this isn't accurate, we can sometimes order a second appraisal. Um, but yeah, I mean, if everything goes as planned, three to four weeks is typically a, a timeline on that. Um, so yeah, so it's, yeah, and it's usually a pretty streamlined, easy process. Um, it's not, uh, not super complex and so yeah. So boom. So now, now, you know, the person feeling golden now, so they went through the whole process. They say, Hey, you know, I found out how much my house is valued that, you know, they um, got with you to, you know, they sent in all the documentation to make sure that they're eligible to get it right. You three to four weeks. They now they um, did a cash out reef. So they have a new mortgage with a new mm -hmm. um, payment, mortgage payment, mm -hmm. right? And depending on what the interest rates are and depending on what um, the balance is, is, is going to probably make a difference on what you're paying more or, or the same Correct. or less. You know, so now they got all this money in their pocket, right? You know, they can go ball out if they want, you know, but, right. <laughs> but I guess what's the suggestion there? Like what's, what, what's the next step that, that people are taking after this cash out refinance? Yeah, well, now if the, if the goal, of course, is to purchase additional property with it. Um, the conversation I usually have at the same time as doing a cash out refi and, and that you should have whoever you're, you're doing this with is making sure you qualify for the purchase. <laughs> you wouldn't want to go through all the trouble with a cash out refi and not know, well, okay, after I do this, can I buy anything? Um, so, yeah, so you definitely want to, to know as you're going through this process, like, okay, so if I get this amount, what am I qualified for a purchase? Can I do a second home with the 10% after closing this cash out refi, do I need to look at doing 15% or, or maybe you do need to do a, a DSCR? I mean, so Parker, DSCRs, let me just chime in. So just to be clear, yeah. they should find out this information before they do the cash out refinance. Before. Okay, gotcha. Yes. Highly recommended. All right. <laughs> so can, can I share, can I share my story of my recent refi uh, experience? Okay. So um, I went to Parker and uh, so I have a property that's, um, it's declined in performance. So it's, um, 
it's a four bedroom in the Smokies and uh, but it's grandma's cabin. So it's uh it's a little bit older, uh meaning like uh the decor. Um so uh we did analysis to determine, hey, if we pulled out some money from equity from the property and with a difference in the mortgage payment, could we make it up and or increase the revenue beyond uh the payment? And so the conclusion was yes. So um i think the the difference in mortgage i'm going to say is about sixteen hundred dollars or so um after the refinance we pulled out 100k just about 100k and with that 100k you know essentially what we're going to be doing is we're looking at the long term so we want this cabin to perform long term and there's a big range of what the cabin can perform and so we want it to be a high performer versus a low average cabin so the the cabin is was doing maybe like let's say 70k this past year which is like it's pretty bad for a four bedroom mm -hmm. um and it can easily do over 100 i pulled some comps and it can do 100 120 if it's a nice like done property so that's kind of the goal for us is we're gonna you know complete that we'll have a little bit of funds left over to also work on another two properties and that's that's the whole the whole point is we're going to be able to increase the revenue let's say well you know our our expense will be 1600 but maybe we'll increase revenue 3 4k mm. is is a goal so mm -hmm. with that with those funds and so I, I i just want like the listeners to think hey the rate is 7% that's too high <laughs> i have a 3% but can you at the bottom, at the end of the day, can you increase your revenue? And is there that opportunity? And if there is, just maybe, you know, do a little analysis to see if that makes sense for your situation. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, it is for our situation. That's why we're doing it. Yeah. Or we did it. Yeah, we just, we, we just closed. So thank you, Parker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I asked Omid when he was doing I was like, okay, let's talk through this. You know what? Because I'm not here to just take people's money and do refis. And, you know, that's not the, the purpose. I want to know, you know, hey, before you, you refinance this great rate to a higher one, you know, um, and not that he has to explain himself to me. Don't get me wrong. But I, I like to have my clients kind of just think through that for them. And he did. I, I mean, smart again. I was just kind of curious on that end. Like, all right, what are you, what are you doing? I mean, what do you think? And then he told me and I was like, OK, yeah, totally, totally makes sense. Um, but yeah, yeah, I do like to have those conversations too. And, so. and that's good. And it's needed. You know what I mean? And I think yeah. that a, a lot of people tend to don't have that conversation. They say, oh, okay, you're here to get a loan, to get a refinance. I can do that. Let's go ahead and, and do it. And not talking about, um, you know, some real life things and asking some real life questions to ensure that you did your research to do what you needed to do to make sure that everything works. Look, obviously cash out refinance. Um, I mean, how many have you done that's in general? Just, I've only done the two. This two? is the first one from mm -hmm. like for an investment property. Okay. And then I did one on my personal residence, the, the one I originally, so I've only done two. So, but it, it's, yeah, based on it started your career, right? Yeah. You know, oh, absolutely. And, and so 100%. I, you know, and, and, and I have, so I purchased a, a long-term rental um long time ago and you know i paid really small money i paid like i don't know thirty thousand dollars for the property right you know i fixed it up and i was renting it out for three years but after three years the property value went up to one hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars you know and i was able to do a cash out refinance on that rental property and you know i think i put out somewhere in the neighborhood of eighty eight thousand dollars maybe some change and i was able to take that money and actually buy, you know, some short term rentals with, you know, and, you know, and, and we're telling the audience these things because once again, like what me mentioned earlier, the bottleneck for the majority of the people is where the money is coming from. And sometimes you're laying in it. Sometimes you're sitting in it, you know, and the money's right there is just listening to episodes like this one at Find Your Freedom with Parker, right? You know, to sit there and, and, and realize what what you're sitting on and you've been sitting on it maybe for some years, you just was not educated 
on understanding what other people are doing out here to sit here and start their career or even, you know, Omi is a seasoned investor and he's still doing mm-hmm. cash out refinances to bring in more opportunity, you know, so it's a lot to learn here. But um, Parker, mm-hmm. we have a question for you. You know, what does yeah. find your freedom mean to you? Great question. Um, for me personally, you know, it's freedom of choices. Uh, it's putting putting myself and my family in a position where where we have choices and, and we have opportunities. And, uh, you know, like with our short-term rental income, I choose to still do loans and be a loan originator. I don't have to. I choose to. I don't know why. <laughs> no, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy helping others. Um, sure, financially, it's a great career too. But, um, yeah, I get to choose to still have a W-2 job. And so having those options is, is freedom for me. Oh, I, I love that. I, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, you, you can't take away the hustle. Like somebody has the hustle or they don't. Right. Like, and they're just like, you know, you, you, I, I think you're a great advocate for others. And I think people love working with you because of, of those things. You're like super easy to communicate with and, and, you know, you find, you find a way. So I think that's what I love about working with you. Um, now you're, you're, you know, in um you know you might be in tennessee you might be in florida or you may be at conferences so if somebody wants to connect with you and they're not in those areas what how can they find you yeah great question so we have a team website now it is wealthbuildersmortgage.com so wealthbuildersmortgage.com and contact info is there along with my calendly link so calendly is usually the easiest way to set up a combo just because all day I'm fighting with underwriters or appraisers or, uh, or on other consultations on other calls. And so that's why Calendly is the easiest. So I can focus on that conversation for that, that time period. So yeah, so wealthbuildersmortgage.com. Awesome. 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 All right, cool. So we're coming to the end of the show and at the end, we know we like to do the big boom session, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. One, two, three, and after three, we're gonna say boom and hold it as long as we can. So can I get some head nods and some yays? Are we ready? All right, let's yeah, do it. Yeah, do it. One, two, three. Boom! Awesome, 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 <laughs> awesome. Listen, this was an amazing episode and it was a lot of valuable things going on. And once again, I want to stress that. A lot of people are always bottleneck when it comes to money. And a lot of the time you're just sitting on it and you're just not educated on what you can do with it. And this episode is one of those episodes that you listen to two, three or four times just to really thoroughly understand what we're saying. Right. And then the next step is get in contact with Parker, you know, have that conversation, you know, because that conversation can lead to all the the uh, questions you don't know what to ask and and answer all the questions that you do ask so you can move forward with at the end of the day finding your freedom then we need you to leave an honest five-star review that's the way that we get more parkers onto the platform so we can get more information to you so you can find your freedom and share this episode share this with your mother your brother your sister your cousin your aunt your uncle you know everyone in the world share it with everyone at your job the ones that you like and the ones that you don't like until the next episode of find your freedom we talk to you soon peace 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 thanks for listening to find your freedom be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts While you're at it, please help us spread the word by leaving a rating and review and sharing the podcast with friends, family, and colleagues. Until next time, get out there and find your freedom.